Welcome to Family Matters. I'm Justice Harvey Brownstone, and today we're going to talk about the most important and most popular form of alternate dispute resolution. It's called mediation. You know, most people who resolve their family law disputes by going to court will tell you that the experience was time-consuming, expensive, complicated, and very stressful. Well, of course it is. They're asking a total stranger to make important decisions about themselves, their finances, and their children. I believe that many of the parents that we see in family court could have resolved their disputes in a much more positive and healing way if they had gone to mediation. What is mediation? How does it work? How long does it take? How much does it cost? And how do you know if mediation is right for you? Our guests today are well qualified to answer all of those questions and much, much more. Let's meet them. First, we have a lawyer with 16 years experience who decided to stop going to court a few years ago and concentrate exclusively on collaborative law and mediation. Please welcome Mr. Michael Lomax. So we go again. And joining Michael is a highly experienced mediator, parenting coordinator, and educator working in the field of conflict resolution with many community organizations, including the South Island Dispute Resolution Center in Victoria, British Columbia. Please help me welcome Ms. Kathleen Purvis Bellamano. Thank you for being on the show. Welcome and thank you both so much for being on Family Matters. It gives me a lot of pleasure to be talking about a subject that I think the public needs to know more about, and that is how to resolve disputes with someone that you may not get along with that well without having a total stranger like a judge decide that. I want to start uh, with you, Michael. You decided to stop litigating uh, and uh, stop going to court and devote yourself to full-time mediation. Why is that? Essentially, I found that uh, when I was in court and even when I would win in court, the problem I was trying to solve with my clients, sometimes I would actually make it worse by going to court for them. And there was one particular file that really changed my whole attitude towards how I dealt with family law. Before that, I, I was exclusively a litigator. I had never been to mediation. I never took mediation training in law school. I did what didn't interest me. I thought it was for wimps. Did mediation training even exist in law school when you there were? There was, uh, they called it alternative dispute resolution training, and you could get exposure to these different processes like mediation. And I thought, that's not what I'm interested. I want to learn about court. And I took advocacy training and things like that in court training when I was in law school. And I did a lot of litigation for a number of years. And then there was a particular file. I represented a parent who paid me $20,000 to get the other parent kicked out of the house, got them interim custody, they moved back into the house, the children were evaluated by a clinical psychologist, we were winning, and my client came to me halfway through the process and said, uh, my daughter's running away, I found an empty 26er in her room, um, what do you think's going on? And it just, the light went on and I went, it's what we're doing. And the court case and the yes. toxicity of it, Yes was impacting on the emotional well-being of a child. Yeah, there was no doubt in my mind. And, and that I, resonated with you to such an extent that you stopped litigating. I, I, made, I wish I had the courage to say that day I said I stopped, but that's the day the light went on. It took me a couple more years to get the courage to say, I'm not doing this anymore. And then on that file, we went to a mediation. That was the first mediation I had ever been to. And it lasted about 10 hours. And at the beginning, these two parents hated each other. They could not agree on anything. And by the end of that mediation, they kind of found themselves again. They were both nice people, and they both got along with each other before this court case, uh, enough. And they agreed to joint custody. The next day, they went and told the children they'd agreed to a 50-50 parenting arrangement. So that was a process that really resonated with you on, on, on an emotional level as well as a professional level. It was a transformative experience for me. And then I realized that was the path I wanted to go on. And then what happened and after that is I would, the clients that wanted to go to court, I would argue with them and tell them these consequences to the point sometimes I got fired. Sometimes I said, I don't want to go to court with you. I'm going to pass you off to another lawyer. And so then 
at some point it was quite easy for me to say, I'm just not going to do it anymore. Well, Kat, Kathleen, although I think you've said I can call you Kat. Please Ka call me Kat. Uh, you saw the light right from the beginning. You are a professional mediator. Your entire training led you to the career you have. You, you are a private practitioner and you work with a lot of community organizations doing mediation. What drew you to mediation and especially family mediation? Um, my ex-husband and I got a divorce in 1990. Well, we separated in 1994 and at that time we couldn't find anything to help us do what we wanted to do. We couldn't find anyone that would help us co-parent our daughter together. We couldn't find anyone that would help us go through it that wasn't adversarial. So we actually stayed married and separated for about six years because we were so convinced that if we went through any kind of process to try and resolve our situation, it was going to get worse instead of better. Did you instinctively know that or did you know from other people who had gone through a court case that it was going to make things bad for you? Everybody that we talked to just said, oh no, you could get a better deal. Oh no, you should. Everybody seemed to ramp it up and encourage us to stick it to each other. And we just didn't want to do that. And, and isn't that what often happens yeah. when a couple breaks up at a time where they're so emotionally vulnerable, the people around them can sometimes ramp it up, uh, which is not really what they should be doing and certainly not what's good for the children. So yeah, let's ask you, uh, what kinds of cases do you deal with? Michael, you had to completely reinvent yourself as a professional. What kind of cases do you deal with now? What um, kinds of disputes? 80% of my practice is mediation. The other 20% is essentially collaborative law, where I, I re do represent clients in family situations, but we don't go to court. And I'm happy to tell our viewers that we have filmed an episode on collaborative law, and I hope that you will watch it as well. But 80% of your practice is mediation. Yep, and a, a bulk and of that would be family mediation. I also do workplace uh, and, and, situations. But what is family mediation? Is it, is it mostly parents fighting over their children, or, or money, or property, or what? Um, well, it can be it can be a whole spectrum of, of things, but in my experience as a lawyer mediator, I end up dealing with kind of similar issues most of the time. And those are children, child support, spousal support issues, property division, assets and debts. So everything that a couple might argue about is available for mediation. You can deal with everything that you might go to court with. Uh, in mediation and resolve it by agreement except for getting divorced. You still need to go to court to do that. But you can even agree to do that, yes, to get and, divorced. And if you resolve everything through in mediation, the divorce is simply a, a very simple, straightforward process. So everything can be addressed in mediation. And Kat, what about you? Who are your clients? Yeah, in, in my family mediation practice, which is most of what I do, it's uh, primarily issues related to separation and divorce. So again, as Mike said, co-parenting, um, spousal support, child support, uh, division of assets, but primarily issues related to the kids is most of what I do. Also, um, some issues related to elders. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of development in the family mediation field around elder mediation. Yeah. That's interesting because we are also doing an episode on elder abuse mm -hmm. in family matters. We really are trying to cover a full spectrum of the types of issues that affect people in relationships, in parenting, uh, and in families and the, anything to do with the well-being of family members, especially children. Um, I want to ask you, what kind of training do mediators get? Michael, you mentioned that in law school there was some mention of alternate dispute right. resolution. Does it annoy you that, that, that mediation is seen as an al alternate form of dispute resolution, as opposed to the court being the alternative I, and mediation being the first point of, of re recourse? I don't have any sensitivity about mediation being called an alternative to the formal processes, but I think there needs to be a whole redesign of the way the family justice system operates, and instead of saying court is the default and these other things are alternatives, is start right back at the beginning and say what's the ideal system look like. So court what training do you get then? I mean, if, if mediation is going to be a much more used option, you need people that can do it. Um, we've got a lawyer and we've got someone who is not a lawyer but is a certified trained mediator and educator. How do you become one? Um, well, uh, there's, there's a number of different courses for someone to become a mediator, different paths. Um, in my case, I, there were a number of opportunities that just came up for me right in that year when I said I want to be a mediator, which was right after I went to this first mediation I'd, I'd been to. 
And um, there's different courses through programs like the Justice Institute of British Columbia in Vancouver and other programs across the country that offer mediation certification programs. And what are they teaching you there, Kat? When you took mediation training, are you learning the law? Are you learning a, a psychology of, of, of uh, people in conflict? What do you learn? It depends. If you're doing, you can do a comprehensive or, or general program, which would doesn't, there's not a lot of legal information in there. It's primarily negotiation skills, uh, learning about interest-based negotiation, listening interest skills. Interest-based negotiation. Yeah. So that's about finding out what, what it is that matters to people. It's, it's more about finding out their why. So instead of just saying, I want the kids on Sunday, it's what is it about Sunday that's important to you. So you learn, if I'm understanding you, you learn about what, what it would take to make peace yeah. between a couple that cannot make peace because they each say they want different things? Yes. How do you ever learn something like that? I mean, we're talking about a very basic human uh, condition. Uh, two people who used to love each other or think that they used to love each other and don't anymore and uh, need an answer, need a solution. How do you teach that? I mean, wars are fought on a much bigger scale yeah. over the same thing that countries can't agree on. On, on solutions. How do you teach that? A lot of role playing, I remember. <laughs> role Just playing? A lot of practice. Practice. And essentially, there are, there's an attitudinal piece that, as a mediator, you need to bring that, which is a belief that people in conflict can resolve it and are capable of doing that. And sometimes allowing people to have an intensity around that, an intensive interaction around that, as long as it's uh, guided and it's respectful, can actually produce positive outcomes. So there's an attitudinal piece. There's a knowledge of process, a process, a way of guiding people through that discussion, which is, can be helpful and can produce positive outcomes 90% of the time, can result in a settlement 90% of the time. And that's really what I'm leading up to. Uh, we see the kinds of training you get. We see the kind of professional development you've had, whether you're a lawyer or not. But what actually is mediation? You've got a couple in front of you who can't agree on parenting issues or financial issues. Can you define for us what mediation is? A simple definition that would help someone <laughs> understand what it is? Because I don't think they can really understand whether it's right for them if they don't really know what it is. What is it that's happening when you're meeting with a mediator? Uh, essentially, I'll take a crack at it. It's um, assisted negotiation. And so negoti assisted negotiation. negotiation. So negotiation is in as simplest form as any attempt to agree about something you disagree about. And um, negotiation, a more complex definition would be a goal-oriented process. So you're solving a problem. You're working together to satisfy your goals and solve a problem. But it requires agreement. And so a mediator, in its simplest form, they are assisting with that negotiation. They are assisting with a process, a way of talking about things, a stage process of working through a problem from what is the problem we want to talk about, what's important to each of you about that problem, what are the options for resolving it, and then if people agree on a solution, how do we implement it? And the mediator is impartial. Mm -hmm. They don't prefer a side or be biased in any way in how they behave. And they're a third party. They're not involved. They're off to the side. And their sole purpose is simply to assist those parties in coming to some kind of agreement. So you need a couple who wants to reach a solution. They genuinely, sincerely want to reach a solution. And I think almost everybody does. I think, I think part of a mediator's job is just to be optimistic. I think most people really want to reach an agreement that works for them. I think that most people don't realize that they can get an agreement that works for them without it being at the expense of the other person. And that's what the mediator does. Yeah, and that's, that's typically people come to negotiation and mediation believing that we can break it down to two, two approaches, distributive and integrative. Distributive is this is a competition, competition over limited resources. There's a pie of, of these limited resources which we must divide. And my job is to get the most of them at your expense. A dollar more for me is by definition a dollar less for you. And therefore my job is to win this negotiation, win this competition. Okay, okay. hold that thought. <laughs> okay. When we come back, we will learn exactly how a mediator can help you decide whether mediation is right for you. Stay with us. Welcome back to Family Matters. I'm Justice Harvey Brownstone and we're talking about mediation with two expert mediators, Michael Lomax and Kathleen Purvis Bellamano. Michael, when we left off, you were telling us about distributive 
versus integrative negotiations. Okay, Tell so us about integrative negotiations. Simply the idea that a negotiation can be about, say, a jigsaw puzzle, and we're trying to solve the jigsaw puzzle. And there's pieces that I need in that solution, and there's pieces that you need in that solution. And if we work together as partners, we can solve the problem. I think a mediator's fundamental job is to help people solve the jigsaw puzzle and, and put those pieces into the, into the puzzle versus competing and fighting over a pie of limited resources. But it's, it, it sounds to me like when people can't communicate with each other, uh, they've broken up because there's a fundamental incompatibility between them. How in the world does a mediator who has no real power over them, you're not a judge, you might, and we will talk about this later, have been given the authority to actually make the decision, but that's a special kind of mediation that we'll get to later. Uh, how do you get people to understand the other person's position and how do you get them to come to a solution? What's that skill about? We ask a lot of questions, uh, primarily open-ended questions. So we're really trying to uncover what's underneath it for folks. Usually when we negotiate or we disagree on something, we stay at the surface and we just tell somebody what we want. We don't really tell them why we want it. And usually that's because we're worried it's going to get used against us. So the mediator tries to create a safe place where we can ask people why they want what they want, what's important to them, and create a, a safe place to do it. And then when folks can do that and then find out it's actually possible to get that why met um, and not be at the other person's expense, we have a lot more possibilities. Now you mentioned, uh, Kat, I think it was you that said that most people do generally want a solution. They want peace, they want to move on and get an, an issue that's important resolved. But is mediation suitable for most people who break up? I, I think it's absolutely suitable for the vast majority of people. Again, I think probably 90% of folks can easily participate in mediation and even the other 10% with the right preparation, with a really good process, they can participate too. It's because at the end of the day, people uh, want to resolve their problem. They don't want to expend resources, money on going to court and fighting, but sometimes they feel like they have no other choice and they kind of project and think it's the other side that's being totally unreasonable. And yet when you get those people in a room and a mediator has a privilege of getting to speak to both sides, I as a mediator see you both want to resolve this. You both want this done. But isn't there a category of circumstances that are, make it not a suitable situation for mediation? Yeah, the, I mean the most common one that comes up is um, where there's been abuse inside the relationship. Domestic violence. Yes. And if domestic violence has occurred, is mediation an option? It can be. Mike and I were talking about this earlier today. It can be in really limited situations. So if the violence is what they call situational violence, so where it's something, uh, an isolated incident that happened, which usually happens at the, fam at the time the family separates, um, not an ongoing history of power imbalance or coercive violence, then it's possible. What That's if it been. is an ongoing yeah. pattern of abuse and where one party has been victimized and the, level, the playing field is not level? Okay, well then, someone who's getting involved in trying to assist them with mediation now, in that situation, there needs to be a lot of preparation and a lot of care taken. And in some cases, it may not be possible. I mean, what if one of them needs a restraining order? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I can't, uh, certainly the understanding that uh, we judges have, and what I've always heard is that uh, if there isn't a level playing field so that both of them are equal parties at the table, able to bargain with each other, uh, it is not uh, at all advisable that they mediate. Is that, is that right? Yes. I, I, there are things that can be done to make the playing field more level. Um, so if, for example, um, a, party who, a person who's been victimized repeatedly really, really wants to do mediation, um, they can get counseling, they can do the work they need to do, they can, they can spend some time. And if after an extended period of time, it's something that they still really want to do, so usually if the violence hasn't occurred for, say, a couple of years, um, then they would, mediation would be possible. And if need be, you could do satellite mediation, which would mean the folks never actually meet. You do it as separate meetings. Is that what they call caucusing? Well, caucusing is when you meet privately with people during a mediation session. You might take a break and meet with them separately. That's what I think of as caucusing. But satellite or shuttle mediation is where the parties may never meet in the same room, and they may never be in the same building at the same time. And if they're working with lawyers who are, are coaching them and advising them throughout the process, 
whatever process they're involved in, court or mediation, they need to make decisions. And if they can work with their lawyer and work with a psychologist, there's preparation that can be done for a process like, uh, like a mediation in some of those circumstances. But again, there are different options like shuttle mediation where again, they may never meet face to face, they may never be in the building at the same time, and the mediator's going back and forth to see if there can be a mutually satisfactory agreement worked out. And it's not always gonna be possible. There's some folks who just never, because of the experience they've had, never become able to self-advocate, and then mediation wouldn't be appropriate. And I've also heard it said that if there's a substance abuse problem, mm -hmm. if there's a mental illness uh, issue, uh, perhaps mediation may not be a, a, a suitable option? Yeah, I mean, I would go with the may not be. Certainly, you, you have a lot more screening to do as a mediator. There's a lot more work to be done. Do you screen everyone for suitability before? Absolutely. So you meet with each party separately mm -hmm. at the beginning, and that's a screening? Yes. So there's the odd circumstance where if, if a counsellor or somebody else who's been involved with them, um, a colleague with professional standings, has met with the parties, and um, knows them well and feels that they'd be suitable for mediation. Occasionally, I will meet with them both at the same time to start with, but usually, I would say 98% of the time, I screen them individually first. And you're looking to make sure that they are suitable for mediation. Absolutely. And you mentioned that if a person is not, that may not mean the end of it because they might, with coaching and counseling, become eligible for mediation. Absolutely. And I guess it's fair to say, or is it, that both parties have to want it? Do you yeah. get cases where a person goes uh, against their will? Do, do courts order people to go to mediation if they don't want it? Yeah, in, uh, in BC, there's a, a, a program called, or a, a process where it's notice to mediate, where one side in a court case can send the other side a notice and say, you have to come to mediation. And one might think, you know, well, that's not going to work if one party's forced into the mediation. And yet, in my experience, I've done a number of those this year, and in every case, uh, both sides have wanted it resolved and one party is surprised the other served this notice to mediate and forced them into the mediation, each side thinking the other doesn't want to resolve it, that they want to go to court. And as soon as they get in a room, in a mediation, all of a sudden these guards drop, we start talking about it, and every one of those that I've had this year has settled. So there are some jurisdictions, and apparently British Columbia is one of them, where one party can actually compel the other to participate in mediation. Uh, that's, uh, that's not the current situation in the jurisdiction where I sit as a judge. It's a very interesting thought and uh, I guess everyone watching needs to know what the options are in the jurisdiction where they live. Now what about having a lawyer as a mediator or having a non-lawyer as a mediator? When do you need a lawyer to do it, if ever? Um, I think those are, those are choices and I, obviously as a lawyer mediator I think there's value in having lawyers do mediation but I, I think there's definitely value in, in non-lawyers do mediation and who come from other professions. Does it matter what you're arguing about? I mean, I think back to law school. Um, if two parents are arguing over financial issues, maybe the value of a business, or um, imputing income to someone whose income may be difficult to ascertain, versus two parents who are arguing about how to develop a parenting plan to determine when the child will be with one and when the child will be with the other, to me those are very different kinds of disputes and that deal with the law differently. Does that matter? I, I would say that generally the lawyer mediator is going to be more qualified to deal with those issues related to you know, income and, and, the, and the legal or law related issues as opposed to the co-parenting or more relationship based stuff. But there are non-lawyer mediators who have had uh, significant training to do that. Um, you know, for example, if you were comprehensive certified by Family Mediation Canada it means you've had hours and hours and hours of family law training. And there is a certification process to become a mediator, is that right? Yes. Uh, there are certification processes out there and that's where people need to be good consumers. Not every mediator has gone through a certification process. It's well, can anybody hang up a shingle and call themselves a mediator in, in, right in North America? Yeah, right now. Really? Yeah, so you, need, you, you think it might change? Yeah. But right now, anybody could decide that they're a mediator and be one? Mm -hmm. But there are, there are panels and there are rosters of mediators in the different provinces and if people just do their homework and look on the web they'll find those very quickly. What would you recommend um, to do a search to find a mediator in your community because this show is being viewed by people in many different jurisdictions all around the world. Um, how would a person find a mediator in their community? Is there an international website or do you just do a Google search with mediator in the name of your city? 
uh, the first thing I would do is say, very likely call the courts, um, speak to somebody at the courthouse, uh, the law clerks or, or legal aid if that's available to you and ask them, is there some sort of roster or some sort of um, governing body in our state, our city, our province? And they'll give you the name of that organization, contact them, and they'll give you the list of mediators that are qualified with them. Now, some people are uh, mediating while they're going to court. As you mentioned, Michael, in the middle of a court case, one party asked another one or compelled another one to participate. Other couples just go to mediation without starting a court case. Do you have a preference for what's the best way to go, or does it depend? My preference is take court off the table. Well, we're going well, to have this good faith, faith mediation. Let's take court off the table so that we're not operating in that pressure cooker. You know, it's very interesting to be a family court judge and to have written a book which in many ways is a plea to the public to reconsider going to court and then hosting a talk show which covers so many alternatives to litigating. And yet I know that there is a value and an importance to court. We're never going to not need a family court. Mm -hmm. How do you tell the difference? Which couples really need to go to court and which don't? You've got a set of guidelines. I mean, you're screening these people. Yeah, I mean, the biggest thing for me is screen for safety first, screen for capacity. Who's? <laughs> <Yeah>. Who's safety? <laughs> Not the safety of the mediator. Yeah, the safety of the parties involved. So that's what those individual pre-sessions do at the beginning is ask them how have problems been solved in the past? Have the police ever been called to your home? There's a, there's a really detailed um, screening process, and most mediators use a pretty specific screening tool, a set kind of checklist that they go through. And then, uh, and then once you've got the answers to that that you need from both parties, and go ahead and start the mediation. And you do continue to screen the whole way through. You continue to keep checking those things. Well, let me ask you the question. We've got a lawyer here who made a conscious decision after a, for, a transformative kind of redemptive experience sure. redemptive. to abandon <laughs> litigation. That's my word, not yours. Sure, okay. We've got a woman that saw the light from the very beginning. It may or may not have had to do with your own personal divorce, but clearly there was a level of maturity there between you and your ex because you both wanted to do something that would make peace, not war. Mm -hmm. Why is it that going to court, in your view, should be off the table? They've heard it from me. Let them hear it from you. Okay, well, um, I think sometimes people do need to go to court. They need to be able to get to a place where they can cooperate. And sometimes people aren't ready or somebody's not ready to do that yet. And sometimes the other side, they need to commence a court process to get things to where there's a readiness to sit down and talk. Why should one avoid court? Um, the most expensive uh, price I saw for people going to court before they came to mediation was $100,000 each. And one of the parties was budgeting $75,000 for trial. And that was just they disagreed whether a daughter was going to live. So cost, um, emotional stress, the... It's incredible when I see people when they're close to the end of their court case and how emotionally wrecked and devastated they can be. So th that's another reason and is time. It's a waste of resources and time to go to court if you're gonna, 95% of court cases settle. So if you're going to settle, why not settle on your own terms in a way that ends up with a positive outcome and it gives a chance for your, if you ch have children, for your co-parenting relationship to be healthy versus poisoned by this adversarial contest. Is mediation the panacea? Is this something that you should be looking into? We'll find out when we get back. Stay tuned. <laughs> Welcome back to Family Matters. I'm Justice Harvey Brownstone and we're talking about mediation with lawyer Michael Lomax and mediator Kathleen Purvis Bellamano. Let's get down to the question that must be on a lot of people's minds. How much does this cost? Do mediators have a, an hourly rate? It, it does vary. For a lawyer mediator, you're going to pay an hourly rate. In my case, my hourly rate is two fifty an hour. I think you're going to find it varies between two hundred and three fifty an hour for a lawyer mediator. Between two hundred and three hundred and fifty dollars an hour, but that's yep. pretty much what you would pay for a family law lawyer anyway, isn't it? That's right, and you get to split that cost with the other person. There's one. Yeah. What about you, Kat? Yeah, the work I do through the South Island Dispute Resolution Center, our fees are charged on a sliding scale based on income and ability to pay. And so it ranges between about $50 an hour up to a maximum of $150 an hour. And is there a limit on how many hours you can access the association if you're on a sliding scale? 
Um, if, you were, if you were paying less than $65 an hour, that's kind of our break-even rate. So if we need to top, top it up at all, we do have a limit in how much we can offer to put in to support you. Are there um, other organizations uh, in other communities across North America that have sliding scale or even free mediation? Yeah, there's a few. There's one in Calgary that I know of. I don't know of another one in... I certainly don't know of another one on the island that does mediation, other but than... But there are some family courts that offer yes, free mediation, exactly. certainly in Ontario yep. where I preside. Uh, my court has a full-time free mediator and mm -hmm. uh, in Toronto where I work, and other courts do... Some other courts have a full-time free government-paid mediator. Yes. And I think that's true in the United States as well in some centers. Yeah. So again, I guess what you said about calling your family court and finding out is a good place to start. Yeah. And then there are private mediators who work by the hour. Yeah. Now you said that you, you, there's only one, so they would split the cost. Yeah. Do people come to a mediator with a lawyer or do they go alone? Again, it, it varies. The majority of the time people come by themselves and they don't bring a lawyer to the process. It saves them money. And if they think they can negotiate for themselves and if someone like myself can give them the information and they can work with that, um, that's usually good enough. Well, um, how do you know whether you need to have a, lo a lawyer come with you to your mediators? Medi I guess these are, do you call them meetings? Um, mediation sessions, sessions. Mediation sessions, yeah. And I would take it that if there's a lot of issues to be dealt with and there's a lot of emotional baggage to get through, there could be a lot of sessions. Yeah, and, take that's, a while. and that's where, again, you can mix it up. You can come by yourself for certain sessions and then you could bring your lawyer to sessions that are more focused on legal issues. And what I would suggest to anybody is you get a consultation with a, lo a family lawyer and you talk with them about the issues and you talk to them about using mediation and, and get their advice and then come and see the mediator again for that initial consultation, that screening session and talk with them about it. And at the end of that, between the lawyer, the mediator and yourself, you'll make a decision about is it best to come by myself initially just to see how it goes and I can always bring my lawyer later if I need to or should we be starting with lawyers present? And it just, it's going to depend on the complexity of the issues. Now you said that mo in most cases people do not come to a mediator with the lawyer at the meeting. Yeah. So is there a role for a lawyer at all in, in the process anywhere? Absolutely. I, I always recommend and I think most mediators recommend that before you sign any agreement that you create in mediation that you have it looked over by a lawyer. It's really important that you get independent legal advice before you sign anything. Before you sign anything. Anything. And it's also important, and I want to repeat this, I know you mentioned it already, that uh, uh, anybody can call themselves a mediator and so it's important to do uh, some homework as a, as a, as a consumer yeah. to find out what the qualifications and training are of the person who's the mediator. And experience. Yeah. And experience. Yeah. And yeah. is it a good idea to get a lawyer to help refer you to a mediator? Uh, that's, again, that's a good option is, you know, to have a consultation with a lawyer and say, can you give me three or four names of, of family mediators that you find are good and experienced in town here? And then that gives you somewhere to go from, yeah. I want to ask you about issues involving children. Um, sometimes in family court where parents are in dispute over custody and access issues, we sometimes have a lawyer that acts for the child. Is there a way in a mediation process uh, that the child takes part in this process? Yeah, in a number of different ways. So uh, sometimes you can hire a professional which will prepare what's called the views of the child report. So somebody who, they're usually a counselor or a social worker, will meet with the child and get their views, get their feedback, and then bring it to the mediation session, bring that report. And puts the child's voice at the table? Absolutely. The child's views and preferences? Mm -hmm. Or you can actually... And who pays for that? The families, yeah. Usually, both parents will split it, and uh, and then the and usually the they you don't have that person that that child specialist prepare a written report. Usually, you have them come and present it. It's much more impactful than a written report, uh, and it really encourages the families to listen. Or some mediators meet with children as well. Now, I want to tell you something that I have heard many times said. It was a sentence I used in my book, Tug of War. Uh, that uh, I got a lot of feedback from. What I said in the book was that mediation is not therapy, but it can be therapeutic. Absolutely. Do you agree with that? I and agree. I'll tell you why I, I say that. I, I have sent many couples to mediation, and they've come back, and, I, and then I've adjourned the case for several months to give the process a chance to work. And I've had people come back telling me that they felt healed. Yeah. They felt that it was therapeutic. What is it about that that does it? 
I know that court's not therapeutic. I try, but <laughs> so far I can't really say that I've been very therapeutic in my case management skills. But what, do you agree that it can be therapeutic? Absolutely. It, it can, it, there can be healing that comes with resolution of conflict, and there can be transformation that comes through working through conflict and resolving it. I had that, that was my personal experience with it when I went to a mediation. It changed, changed my way of looking at conflict and how it could be resolved. And um, yeah, so there's, there's a, a healing aspect to it when people are able to work through a really difficult situation like that and get a sense of resolution. People experience conflict. Emotions drive conflict. Yeah. And so if people are able to resolve a conflict, that's going to help with uh, their emotions and help with their psyche. And psyche. I would say maybe 15, 20, maybe even as much as 25% of the families that I've worked with, by the end of the session, there's almost always tears, and have said, you know, if we'd done this mm -hmm. five or 10 years ago, we wouldn't have gotten a divorce. If we'd learned to listen to each other and talk to each other and pay this much attention to what each matters to each other, we wouldn't have needed a divorce. Have you ever seen a couple get back together? I have a couple of times, yeah. Maybe you're meant to be marriage counselors <laughs> and not, no. not mediators. I mean, I think that's actually uh, very empowering. It, the, the, the theme that I get listening to you talk about the impact of mediation on a couple in conflict is that they felt empowered. Yes. Maybe it is healing too, but the fact that they, with help, came to a conclusion, a solution to a problem together Their and solution. did not turn it over to a third party mm -hmm seems to have empowered them. And do they learn skills so that if they have disagreements in the future, they can apply those again? It depends on the mediator. Some, some mediators are really transparent about sharing with the family the skills they use to get where they are, and some, some mediators don't. Um, generally, it's something I pay a lot of attention to because my perspective is that these folks are pretty much stuck with each other, especially the ones that have kids. They're stuck with, with each other for a long time, and so any skills that they can learn to resolve this means that they can do it on their own next time. Well, you can be an ex a husband or an ex-wife, you're never going to be an ex-mother yeah. or an ex-father. So in a sense, you know, uh, you are. You, you, you do have to deal with each other for what, 20 years. It's a 20-year yeah. commitment at least to have children. And then there's grandkids and weddings and all of that after that. And I often feel sometimes in court that I am deciding a case based on the dispute that's in front of me and the evidence that the parties have presented to me. And then they got a decision. I don't know how equipped they are to resolve other disputes that may come up in the future. For example, they may have had a difficulty over Christmas holidays or how to divide the summer holidays. Uh, maybe they w that my decision will be helpful to them next year and maybe it won't. Uh, it really depends. And I'm wondering whether when you go to mediation, even if you had to pay for it, uh, do you end up developing a better, a better relationship with each other, a better ability to communicate with each other through the mediation process that you might not have those conflicts in the future? Mm. I think it, it has that potential. It sends you in a different, on a different path where we can work together and resolve these problems. Sometimes we need some help from someone like a mediator, and sometimes we won't. But it does develop a sense of that capability and that competence that we can do this despite the difficulties that we've had. I think that's definitely possible, and I see it a lot. I see, I definitely see people who contact me later, and those are the kinds of, they've said, an issue has come up here, we need your help, but they tell me all the other things they've been able to work out or maintain on their own. Well, I don't want people watching to think that uh, mediation is perfect for everyone, that it is the magic solution in every single case. I think that would be unfair and misleading. Yeah. I want to ask you, in our remaining minutes, uh, what situations have you seen where mediation has broken down? I had one where uh, in the middle of the mediation, one of the parties, the husband, sold the house. Literally just did a private sale and sold it because his name was the only one on the title. Behind the other party's back. Yeah, that ended our mediation. I can kind of guess <laughs> yeah. why. Any horror stories from you, Michael? Um, just, just situations where people, um, they get close to solving it. And I think there's still high levels of resentment. And on some level, I've been in situations, I remember one in particular, and I said, it looks to me like everything you said on the list that you wanted, you seem to have here. How do you feel about this? And the person said, you're right, but they've got something that I didn't, I didn't want them to get, and I don't agree. And it was because they were seeing the other person coming out satisfied and okay with it, and they weren't happy about that. Again, the emotional yeah. implications of the, the fallout. Yeah. Now, I promised that we would mention uh, mediation arbitration, which mm -hmm. is 
a special kind of mediation where the parties enter into an agreement at the beginning that they will try to resolve it themselves with the help of the mediator. And if they can't, the mediator gets to decide. You shift hats and you become an arbitrator, a judge. Do you do that? Um, I do in a, in a specific role called parenting coordination. So the family signs up with you. Is that what a parenting you. coordinator is? Yeah. A mediator who also decides. Yeah. So why don't you just decide at the beginning? I do it. It's fun. <laughs> Well, for me, I think it's really, it's a, it's a developmental piece and a growth piece, growth piece for the family that if they can do it on their own, again, as you said, they're empowered. Um, they, they gain the skills and they gain the capacity. They set really good examples for their kids if they can decide themselves. And so then we're just there as the plan B or the backup if they're really stuck. So do you give them a hint as you're going along of how you're going to decide it if they don't agree? It depends on how much information you've got. So usually I'll say, if, if I'm going to be the one making the call on here, I'll need more information. I'll need to speak to the children's counselor, very often to the children themselves. Because it's about whether or not the kids can get their ears pierced or whether or not they have to go to summer camp this year. And so for me to get that, it's not enough for me to just get the, the perspective of the two parents. I want it from some outsiders as well. Any myths about mediation that you think the public should uh, know to help dispel? This is an important show. I have never seen a telecast talk, mm. uh, pr present this kind of information, and I think it's really important. So in our re in a few remaining moments, uh, just what do you want to say? A, lo to a lot of what there? you see on television is not helpful information about on TV shows or whatever. And Except this show. Yeah, <laughs> this one is, is unique, I think. And essentially, people have a disbelief that they can sit in a room with somebody that they have a conflict with, and they could actually resolve it. That doesn't make sense to them. And they think, I have to go to court and speak to a judge, a third party, who can impose a decision on us because this other party is so unreasonable. And in my experience with mediation and the statistics bear this out, 90% of the time, those people can come together, sit down and resolve it and feel much better about the outcome. And it's much more likely to last. And that's a myth that people just intuitively don't think that's possible. It doesn't make sense to them when they're in a conflict that that could happen. And yet it does. And it happens many, many times over and over again. It's more likely if you're in a situation like that, it can happen in yours. And so it's disbelieving that and saying, I'm capable of resolving my own dispute, and maybe this other person wants to resolve it too. With some help, we can do it. There you have it. I think this has been an excellent opportunity for our viewers to really take a good hard look at mediation and also at themselves and ask themselves, are they in a dispute with someone that they may intensely dislike but is there a way to rise above that and reach peace with each other with some skilled help? I hope that you found this program helpful and informative. If you're interested in considering whether mediation is right for you, please look it up, check it out, and thank you so much for watching. Thank you both for being here with us today. From all of us here at Family Matters, thank you for joining us. See you next time.